Right, our next speaker is um, Professor uh, Jose Natio Latore from the National University of Singapore and also my boss currently at the CQT. He is appointed director of the Center for Quantum Technologies in 2020 and the professor and provost chair at the National University of Singapore Department of Physics. Well, uh, Jose Natio was working on particle physics before he uh, exploit, uh, uh, comes into uh, quantum information. And so he's equally fluent in particle physics. Uh, he joined uh, CQT NUS from the University of Barcelona, and he has been heading a group, a uh, research group at the Barcelona uh, Supercomputing Center to build the first quantum processor in Spain. Uh, Barcelona Supercomputing Center is an excellent place. Uh, you'll be amazed if you visit the place because it's built from an old church. Uh, Professor Latore is also founder of the Centro de Sciences de Benest, uh, Petro Pasqua, uh, essentially is the Benest Center for Physics. And, uh, and um, he, he's, um, he's, he's well known uh, for organizing many, many good conferences. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Alfred. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I'm really very happy to, to talk here in, the, in this centennial celebration. And let me, since you were talking to the young people, let me address myself to the young people. Because my first encounter with uh, the ideas of young was when I was in my last year of university. This is, in Spain, it was five years physics. So it was in the fifth year. And uh, we had a course on uh, quantum field theory but with uh, emphasis in, in young Mills theory, uh, and even going to this uh, you know, uh, more mathematical way of introducing uh, young Mills, so with fiber bundles and all these things. But in parallel, we were doing particle physics, and suddenly we had the discussions of parity breaking and CP breaking. And we ended up uh, uh, theoretical physics six students only was quite selective uh, out of 200 that we enter. Uh, it was very uh, frequent to fail people in, in those times. And we never had the hope of, uh, of having a career ourselves, OK? Never. So actually, we were extremely enthusiastic about discussing because you know, you're, you're not playing for a job or anything. It was for knowledge. Uh, it was really impressive how much we, we discussed symmetries. So this idea that uh, you, you come from, from the first mathematics, when you make into mathematics the laws of physics, starting with really with Newton, okay, and you have calculus, how later we have uh, an energy principle, Hamiltonians, okay. But then suddenly in the 20th century, we move beyond, and we have the, we define the theory through symmetries. That was very impressive. The fact that we have quantum mechanics, we have not probabilities, but let me say the probability amplitudes, so the square root of the probability, to say in some way, then you can attach uh, to the wave function a complex number. That's the first thing. And therefore, it can implement representations of symmetry groups, which are non-trivial, have SU2. You can have spin, otherwise you could not have spin. And adding these extra quantum numbers, finally you have the uh, gauge symmetry. And in particular, you have the young mills lagrangian And then, automatically, this mapped into the real theories of nature. It's very impressive. And then parity. Why parity is violated? Why? Who ordered that? Okay. Why CP is violated? Why T? Why there is no... Why at microscopic level, not at macroscopic, but at the, at the most tiny element of nature, why there is an error of time? Why there is a T violation, OK? Well, those were discussions, heavy discussions, really heavy. Uh, so, and then later on, I learned about uh, integrability, and I, I came, first I came to the Young-Pass equation, and then I learned in conformal field theory 
the Li Yang singularity, the central charge negative. <laughs> so this guy is everywhere. So I think, and then the, the Wu Yang uh, papers, <laughs> it's really, really remarkable. So uh, what I wanted to do today was not say anything uh, that I'm doing in quantum computing, okay? But r rather one thing, it is far from being either popular or relevant, but my own discussion of trying to get into the heart of P symmetry and, and what, what I understood. So take it for the value of it. So the very first idea is extremely deep. So what is the ultimate description of nature? What is it? Okay. Is it a Lagrangian? Is it an energy principle? Is it a symmetry? What is it? So uh, let me quote here the idea of John Archibald Wheeler, okay, who in the end of his career uh, wrote a number of essays which are really remarkable. Maybe you know that uh, post-selection was a word invented by him or, or no cloning or, well, or many others, a warm uh, hole. All these ideas uh, were labeled by him. He put the name. And he wrote a number of essays where he essentially the idea, and I'm quoting him, uh, is that all things physical are information theoretic in origin. So what, what is the ultimate principle of, uh, to describe nature? It should be something which is absolutely high level. Okay? And he claimed it would be information theory. This is well before our quantum information, okay, well before. So in this sense, what uh, uh, Nelly showed us, uh, one of the ideas in information theory, which is surprise, which is entropy. So to what extent these ideas can be used to understand the ultimate reason why we have the nature as we have it. So what I did with my colleagues, was really the first question, how entanglement okay, is generated in, in the laws of physics. Uh, think carefully. When you go to the lab, you typically use an effective theory. You don't use a fundamental theory. You use something that, be, that describes correctly what you are doing in the lab. But you don't go to basic principles. You don't go to a single electron interacting with a single photon. So why don't we, for a moment, we visit that? Why don't we go to, down to the heart? Why don't we go to QED? And uh, uh, this is an example to tackle this problem. You simply say, OK, imagine that I have two electrons. They have a quantum number, which is helicity. It is called left or right. This is the projection in the direction of the momentum of the spin, OK? And uh, I do observe in nature this quantity, and I can prepare a product state, so left, left, and then they collide, and I ask myself whether they can get entangled, okay? Now, if this happens, this is the basic laws of nature. The first thing is how, how you quantify entanglement. And if you have a two uh, elements of two levels, like here, left, right, and then two particles, uh, the most general cat is alpha, LL, beta, gamma, and delta. And as it is proven in this theory of uh, quantum information, you can define an invariant uh, on the local operations that quantifies entanglement. Okay? And in this particular case, uh, we, you can use different ones. This is concurrence. And this is alpha, delta, minus beta, gamma. Okay? It is bounded by one. Zero, it's a product state. One is a maximally entangled state. It's a singlet or one piece of uh, any of the belt states. So, and then you go down to the really how things operate. And the way the things happen is that the photon uh, with an elicity couples to a current, so, which is described as the anti-fermion, Clifford algebra fermion. And the electric charge is there. That is the amount of coupling you have. And you can do that to simplify in a particular frame, high, en high energies, for instance, to have a simplified version. And you do the computation. So you do the Feynman diagram. And when you end up, you see that the result is rather simple. It depends on the angle the particles leave. 
but essentially uh, you have a cosinus theta minus one L R plus cosinus plus one R L. So to have maximum entanglement, what I need is a plus, and therefore this is for the angle pi, pi halves. So actually you have a collision, and when they go in the uh, orthogonal direction, they are maximally entangled. If not, they are not maximally entangled. Okay. Now. You can ch check in other processes, and there is another mechanism, which is when you have indistinguishable particles, two electrons, and then you have two channels. You have the T channel and you have the U channel. And there, the mechanism is completely different. You can check that for any energy, you get maximal entanglement if you go, again go in the direction which is perpendicular, okay? But this now is based on indistinguishability of the two final states. So these are the two mechanisms, and there are no other, no more mechanism, either the S channel or the indistinguishability of the S, uh, of the T and U channels. The two ways you can get maximal entanglement. So that's the first lesson. Yes, QED does provide a mechanism to go from a product state to a maximally entangled state. Now, it was gauge symmetry related to that? Well, to check that, do the following trick. Go back to the, young, to the uh, fundamental QED Lagrangian and modify the coupling. So invent a coupling G mu instead of the Clifford algebra gamma mu and do the same computation with these arbitrary matrix. And then this is a lengthy thing. I will let me go through it very fast. So you do a computation with all these new things, okay? And you compute every process, the Baba scattering, Compton scattering, perennialization, Mott scattering, Muller scattering, all of them. And you ask that all of them have a regime where you have maximal entanglement. And it, one by one, they provide a constraint on these G matrices. And, uh, on top, you want consistency. You don't want that in one process you get the solution, in the other, an incompatible solution. And you may even wonder whether the solution to this system of equation is unique or not. And what you find, I bypass the technicalities, is that in all these two body processes, there are always two gamma, so there is an ambiguity in the sign that can only be solved if you go to three body processes. But for all the two body processes, essentially, the solution is the Clifford algebra. So QED is the solution to manage to get maximal entanglement in all the processes. So there is an extremely deep relation. You may argue that this is not so peculiar because gate symmetry is a symmetry and when, what you want is to equal amplitudes for the two possibilities. So entanglement is talking about some sort of symmetry. So that's why they are so much related. So this is the summary of this piece. You can do this analysis in any reference frame. You get the same results. You can you can see that there are no pools. All of them go in the same direction. It's a systematic, unique solution, okay? Gauge symmetry is the solution to maximal entanglement. Or maximal entanglement comes from this effect. So uh, it's an isolated maximum. So you may, if you believe in it from qubit, that the nature follows uh, information ideas, you could formulate it in this way. World is quantum. So it's not classical. So Bell inequalities must be violated, okay? I negate the classical world. I, I, we claim that the world must be quantum. If Bell inequalities have to be violated and maximally violated, then a maximum entangled principle should be there. And from it, you can get the other uh, ideas. Now, uh, when I was giving this talk in, at CERN, so uh, some a person, a famous person asked me, but if there is such a principle, can you apply it not to the symmetry, but to the, parameter, to the parameters of the standard model? So we don't know why the mass of the electron is what it is, why the mass of the mu is what it is. We don't know the parameters, and there are 20 something. So could you fix further? 
the laws of physics, or can we say that maximum entanglement is somehow related in a way we don't understand to the two parameters, and in particular to the sinus of, of the weak angle. Okay, I remind you that uh, this is the coupling now of the weak interactions, and you have a vector and an axial current. This is GV and GA, uh, and one goes with uh, gamma mu, and the other with gamma mu, gamma five. Gamma five is responsible for parity violation. Okay, uh, and those are numbers, and we have measured them, so we have values for them. Nature has provided values for them, and. Uh, Again, to make a story short, the place where you can check this in easier is in the decay of the Z particle to fermion and antifermion. And you have all these computations there and there. And there, you can check, because you have a particle going to two particles, whether you have maximal entanglement or not. And when you do all the computation, the solution of maximal entanglement is obtained when the vector current is zero. And that is when the sinus square is one fourth dot twenty five. So you have maximal violation of parity. Uh, the nature is extremely close to that. It's point twenty three. This is a three level computation. So you know, science curve could be anything. And nature has given point twenty three, and you have maximal entanglement in point twenty five. And this is the three level computation. Actually, if you go to one loop, it turns out that things go in the direction towards, uh, in the right direction for maximal entanglement, but in one loop, you, in, in all these loops, they do not get there, okay? You will not bridge from 23 to 25. Still, it's simply a remarkable fact. Now you go to every other process, and again, the same thing happens. It's consistent with sinus squared one fourth, okay? Why? So let me conclude here with this idea no? that maximum entanglement is a tantamount to gauge symmetry uh, at three level in QED, uh, and that maximum entanglement prefers a sinus square one fourth. Uh, could we try to do these things in other places? Yes, you can use that for resumations, renormalization group, ultraviolet completion of theories, you can use effective theories, car perturbation theory, gravity. I have some results in other places which are always in the direction that something amazing goes on with uh, entanglement. And uh, uh, I'm just finishing on time, but I think I'm not increasing my voice, uh, with two quotes. And the very first is by Planck. So, now we are living all these times that you have to justify every time what is this useful for. All the questions that were asked were, can you do anything better? We are driven by utilitarianism. Uh, but all these things that we have were never driven by utilitarianism. It was the, pers the pursuit of knowledge, absolute knowledge. So Planck said that very beautifully. Like he said, the outside world is something independent from man, something absolute. And the quest for the laws which apply to this absolute appear to me as the most sublime scientific pursuit in life. And I fully subscribe to this. As, it, as a matter of fact, when you pursue truth, it turns out to be useful. But it's subsidiary, okay? at least to me. And. Uh, Final quote is even older. This is by Arthur James, the first count of Balfour, the year of Balfour, in a book, 1908. And he, and he says, and makes the connection that I'm trying to make from absolute knowledge to applied knowledge. He says, but science is the great instrument of social change. All the greater, because its object is not change, but knowledge. And its silent appropriation of this dominant function. And the, in, amid the dean of political and religious strife, is the most 
vital of all the revolutions which have marked the development of modern civilization. So it's not the object of science change of our social uh, way of relating, but as a matter of fact, is the most important instrument to change the way we live. And I think I'm there. And well, thank you, Professor Yang. Thank you. Right, any questions from the floor? Yes, good, thank you. Yes, he's from uh, NUS High School, I think. So it must be a good question. Hello. Yeah, uh, you uh, said that the, the quote by Wheeler that uh, all of physics uh, is information theoretic. Uh, by that, uh, does it uh, mean anything more than the fact that information is always conserved in physics? So there's actually a similar question here. Based on our understanding, does science start with information? Any justification? Yeah, there are very few people that have gone into, have taken the endeavor of understanding at the very fundamental level. But why don't, don't we provoke you in a different way? So imagine that we, we go to high energies and we go to quantum gravity, okay? You know gravity is a classical theory for us. It must have a quantum regime, black holes and, and the Big Bang is there, described by that theory. We don't really know what it is. String theory is an attempt, but by no means satisfactory. Uh, but then you understand carefully that gravity is about making space-time dynamical. Space-time obeys a differential equation, okay? It's a solution of a differential equation. It's a dynamical element. Uh, so when you go there, that object simply behaves in a way that we don't understand. Very likely, the space-time as a continuous manifold will no longer be there, will no longer be. All this idea that you see space-time as a continuous thing probably is, will be broken. So when you go there, I give you an example of an idea by a very good guy, by Gerard Tuft, he's a Nobel laureate. He argues that you may have discrete uh, varieties, and therefore there, the only evolution are permutations, he says. Then he phrases the dynamics of that system as a conservation of unitarity, okay, of probabilities, which is information. So indeed, what you are saying goes into that direction. So what are the fundamentals that may be operating at the ultimate level, there should be the very basic ideas about information. Okay, that's the sort of the flavor you see in the papers by Tuft. So I, I, I do think, I think I will die without knowing, but I agree that this is the way to go. So online there is actually one question that follows one minute later, and that was, there is a saying that anything contains information, and what are your thoughts on this? I, I Th guess you Say answer. that again, sir. Anything contains information, what are your thoughts on it? I guess you have answered that, more or less. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there is hey, also... Let me add to think. The laws of physics as we do them, they contain uh, uh, magnitudes that have dimensions, space, time, mass, huh? F equal MA, so all the laws of, uh, of nature, which are whatever laws, have a unique response by a point-like particle, which is related to inertia, and then a change in space-time. So mass, length, and time. So that's what the units of the interactions can be made out of mass, L, and T. Three magnitudes, two ratios, time and length. This is speed of light. This is relativity controlling that limit, and the other is H bar, is quantum mechanics controlling that limit. Okay, so the three magnitudes, two relations. But if you think carefully, you would like to have a fundamental theory, which is dimensionless. Okay, and that's information. It's dimensionless. So there are about three more questions, but I'm going to just choose one. 
uh, more provocative than the others? Why are some people confused with zero information in a fully enclosed room with walls all over? Is there a way to understand or realize that there's a lot of imagination and that such information is possibly endless? <laughs> <laughs> well, this is a poetic question, and of course I agree. But I think also we should be careful in when we address scientific uh, questions. They have to be well defined, and they have to, it's the only way to make steady progress, okay? That we take one good question at a time and we try to solve it in a humble way. Okay, it makes no sense to think that the Greeks were trying to, whatever, to solve the universe, okay? They had first to understand, uh, you know, uh, how acceleration, for instance, okay? That, as you know, Aristotle didn't get it. So we need very solid progress in science, okay? There are some questions that we have to accept that they are beyond our understanding nowadays, okay? They're too early to answer those questions, simply. So there are actually two more questions if you want to answer. But uh, any question from the floor? I think I always uh, would, since it's a face-to-face -face meeting, uh, it's always mm. good to get your feedback. The, somebody says whether our brain stores unlimited information? By no ways. Huh? Very limited. Mm. This quantifying information is one of the things we have learned recently, maybe not in full glory, but we understand that our brain is limited, definitely. Encryption. Oh. Encryption is a big thing. Huh? I hope that if it is done by a young person, come to our center. That's a question from the floor. <laughs> Sorry? Uh, okay, this is related to the question about how the universe is fundamentally information theoretic as posed just now. But I was wondering, is there any approach you would use to build up some of the properties of quantum systems, like for example, uh, the collapse of a wave function from fundamental informational principles? The wave function is the way we codify information. So if you, depending who teaches you, the postulates, but you know, from 1930, little von Neumann wrote the first time the postulates. Remember, science operates by in a reductionist way. That we isolate what we don't understand in the postulates. There is nothing I can do to prove that postulate. Okay, uh, I check whether the consequences are okay. If they are not, I change the postulates. So the postulate number one is that all available information of a system is codify in a state vector in a Hilbert space. It sounds as a very, very complicated postulate, but it is comparable to classical physics. But it should be called the zero principle of classical physics, because when you learn physics uh, traditionally, it says the first law is the existence of uh, inertia, inertial reference frames, second is F equal MA, and third is action-reaction. Properly taught, let me say with the twist of the 20th century, 21st century, the first, the zero postulate should be uh, that observable, observable uh, particles live in R3, in a space time, and uh, change in time. This should be a postulate. You, in the same way as in quantum mechanics, you say to heal the space, they should say R3. And actually, the third law is about the isotropy of the space. It's if you postulate isotropy, you can prove the third law. Okay, uh, many people don't do that, or don't, uh, they have never seen that, but you can do exactly that, okay? So it's a dynamical principle, which is second, which is even more sophisticated, but because you don't have definition of force, Mach wrote about that, Einstein read all the things by, by this. So I think that the wave function, to answer first your question, is the way we encode the information about the quantum system, okay? It's a, a layer which is not unobservable itself, but it contains information about the, the quantum system. All right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, you want to answer some of the questions, or you? There are more? I, uh, but I don't have the... There was something about encryption. <laughs> uh, that's a big thing, encryption, because it affects the politics, okay? Yeah. So there will be an enormous amount of, um, of efforts to understand to the ultimate level, okay, 
how we can secure information using the ultimate understanding of the laws of nature that we have, which is so far quantum mechanics. Okay? May not be the final solution by far. Many people, uh, Einstein thought this was a, an effective theory. Before you answer, there's one from the floor. Yeah, go ahead. One question. So do you believe it could be, we could see some deviation from quantum mechanics? People have looked for that. <laughs> you know, there are so many Nobel prizes there if you find one. Uh, people have looked for everything. Non-linearities of the uh, Schrodinger equation, uh, violations of, of things like uh, uh, Poincaré symmetry, uh, which is related to PCT, by the way, the theorem uh, relates. So of course, we are all the time in the labs trying to check deviations, okay? We are all the time, but so far, there is none. Okay, there is none. I think that the, and now I'm talking, please, the young people don't take my word. This is an opinion, okay? I think that quantum mechanics will refine the postulates of measurement, okay? I think that the projection of the wave function and the collapse and the probabilities, these may change as experiments are finer and finer in the, in the next decades, okay? So I think that we simplified what the measurement was because we didn't have internal control of everything, I think this will move. So I do see a progression of the ideas of quantum mechanics coming, but this very solid progress, now little by little, we are learning that maybe uh, the measurement was simplified in the postulates of the 30s, okay? Right. There are many other ideas about changing the postulates of quantum mechanics in a radical way, but that would take us very far. Right. Thank you very much, Garces. Bye -bye.